Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session, Medicaid and Community Living. My name is Denise Lugo Fowler, and I'm the Director of Training and Outreach for Disability Rights New Jersey, and I'm thrilled to be the host uh, this session this morning. I will be uh, the moderating the session and um, checking the chat. So if you have any questions or need any support, please feel free to drop the questions or um, issues in the chat and I will address them. And some housekeeping. Um, if everyone can please put their microphones on mute and turn off the videos just to limit the distractions for now. Um, you can turn them on later when we're doing some questions. Um, and feel free to use the chat to share information, ask questions, and we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please, you know, I encourage everyone to participate and share and ask questions. And for anyone who needs it, um, there are um, captions for the sessions as Mike Murata mentioned during the opening welcome. Um, so if you need that, it's across the bottom of your Zoom menu bar, it's either um, you'll see the CC or live transcripts. Click on that and you will see the transcripts showing across your screen. Um, and if you experience, like I said, any technical issues, drop them in the chat and I will be happy to address those. And also um, you'll see that, um, or you should have gotten the message that we are recording all the sessions and that's so that we can post these on our YouTube and website and you can access any of the resources later on. Um, and with that, I would like to welcome our panelists today. We have Gwen Orlowski, the Executive Director, Michael Brower, Managing Attorney, and Charles Auslander, our Senior Staff Attorney from Disability Rights New Jersey. And with that, I will turn it over to them. Great, Denise. I think, can you forward a slide, please? I sure can. Thank you. Maybe not. All right, here we all are. Great, one more slide. So good morning, everyone. I think that we have a relatively small group here, which is great because these sessions that we're running um, from Disability Rights New Jersey's attorneys and advocates are really meant to be a round table discussion. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this when I get into to some of the substance that I'm gonna talk about about what we have available um, in our resource center. But I wanna begin by reminding everyone who we are. We're Disability Rights New Jersey. We are the um, designated protection and advocacy agency for the state of New Jersey. Um, every state has a designated and territory has a designated protection and advocacy agency. Um, and if you were on the session at the beginning, you've already heard my little spiel on this, uh, but uh, we are, um, exist under federal law. Um, kind of like the long-term care ombudsman does as well. Uh, and there's a series of protection and advocacy statutes that were passed by Congress beginning in the early mid 1970s. Um, and and uh, the establishment of protection and advocacy agencies stems from a uh, documentary, an expose by Geraldo Rivera in the early 70s about an institution in New York called Willowbrook. And from that Congress uh, decided that they needed to act and they needed to statutorily create and fund um, agencies that could ensure uh, the protection and rights-based advocacies for people with disabilities. And here I touch a little bit on the authority that we have. Our authority is really awesome under federal law. Um, it's, it's just, it's so expansive and deep. Uh, we have the right to investigate or the, really the obligation to investigate reports of abuse and neglect. Um, and so, uh, and that's anywhere a person with a disability um, is residing or receiving services. We also can monitor institution and providers to ensure for the protection of rights. I like, we call that our investigation and monitoring authority. In addition, we're a law firm within, within Disability Rights New Jersey, we, and we represent clients with disabilities in legal matters based on priorities set by our board. And we actually take public input put into that priority um, setting process every year. We just finished it for this year. Um, next year, we're going to do a more in-depth, um, expansive uh, process. We do that every several years. 
Um, and we have lawyers and we rep and advocates and we represent individuals with disabilities free of charge. Um, and for the most part, we have no financial uh, eligibility criteria like a legal services office might have. Um, there's some small exceptions to that where we get some funding from the state of New Jersey. Um, we also provide information, referral and technical assistance as well as outreach training and education, especially focused on individuals um, who advocate for themselves. And all is to further our mission, which is to preserve the um, preserve and advance the human, civil, and legal rights of people with ha who have disabilities. Next slide. So um, I'm going to touch a little bit. We have uh, three short presentations now, and then we really uh, want to open this up for conversation and for your questions. Um, I'm going to be talking about what I call Medicaid eligibility 101. And then Charlie is gonna focus on one Medicaid eligibility program, workability, because we know that workability is one of those programs that's so essential, especially for individuals with disabilities. And then Michael um, is going to come up at the end and he's going to discuss appealing um, services and supports, denials or reductions or terminations through managed care organizations. And uh, I believe that this was in the materials when you signed up, but I think it bears uh, repeating and reminding that um, all of us have already done uh, webinars that are very in-depth and detailed oriented on all of these subjects. And they are stored on our website and maybe somebody can put the link in the website for me. That would be great under our um, self-advocates resource in our resource library. Um, and right now they're spread out uh, depending on what topic they are on. And one of the things we're gonna look to do on the other side of this is see if we can have one portal for everything that got presented today. So it's easy for people to find. So I'm gonna touch on Medicaid eligibility 101. And again, the in-depth, very detailed orient, uh, uh, webinar is, is available on our website. Though so feel free to ask uh, questions. Um, when I speak about Medicaid eligibility, one of the things um, I really want to convey to people, and before I was the executive director at Disability Rights New Jersey, I was a frontline legal services attorney um, in Central Jersey Legal Services. I, so I worked with clients every day. And what I found was that people really don't understand, why would they, um, that Medicaid has you know, many eligibility programs. Um, and you only need to be eligible under one of them. You don't need to be eligible under all of them. And all of them have slightly different eligibility criteria. And so it's very important to know which program you're on. And if for some reason you're having difficulty getting onto Medicaid or you're at risk of being terminated from Medicaid, it's good to talk with somebody like somebody at Disability Rights New Jersey to kind of explore what other possible Medicaid eligibility you might have. Because again, you only need to be eligible under one of the programs. Sort of the point that goes hand in hand with that is that if you're already on Medicaid and it looks like you're gonna lose eligibility for one program, for example, you're on workability and now you're not working anymore. The Medicaid agency, which means the Medicaid agency itself and all the entities that do their eligibility determinations, the county welfare agencies, some of you may call that the Board of Social Services, what we call New Jersey Family Care, um, which does is an outside vendor um, and so on and so forth. Whoever does the eligibility determination for the Medicaid um, agency, they cannot terminate you from Medicaid until they've reviewed your eligibility under all possible program eligibility. And that obligation rests with them, not on the Medicaid beneficiary. And at the end, Michael's gonna to touch on the Medicaid moratorium right now. So you sort of understand where we are at this moment in time. But when we're on the other side of that, it's really important to know that if you get a termination notice for one program and they have not screened you for all program eligibility, that in and of itself is sort of a stop button um, uh, in the process for termination, it's really important to seek um, assistance from legal services, from Community Health Law Project, or from us here at Disability Rights New Jersey. And then my fourth um, really critical uh, point is that if you uh, receive a termination notice, um, it's really important to know that you have appeal rights. Um, and if you are already on a Medicaid program, uh, you have a right to continuation of benefits pending appeal 
And the time frame to do that in is really rather tight. And Michael's going to touch on that in the context of managed care appeals, but it's the same time frame for an eligibility determination. So to get those continuation of benefits, you have 10 days. So if you get that kind of notice, again, really important to call us, Legal Services, Community Health Law Project, um, but don't wait to hear from us to exercise that right to, um, you know, it's a form. Check it off that you want continuation of benefits pending appeal. Send it back in. Make sure you use certified mail um, so you have proof or um, a fax so you have proof to preserve that right to continuation of benefits because the appeal process can take a very long time and it's really critical to keep those benefits while you're um, going through the process, especially if you have not been reviewed for eligibility under all the different programs. Next slide, Denise. Looks like we're having little technical difficulties with the next slide. Thank you. So this is um, a slide that actually comes for the presentation. And what it's meant to do is represent um, the very large umbrella of New Jersey's Medicaid program, which is called New Jersey Family Care. And that includes both Medicaid and for children, the children's um, the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and, um, and just sort of give a graphic that there are these many, many doors to eligibility. And in this presentation, I'm not gonna go through them all, um, but they are in the online webinar and you can take a look at it. And certainly if you have any questions or you have a particular issue going on in, in your situation, you, you can give us a call but it's important to get a sense of um, the different ways you might be eligible for Medicaid. So for example, when you move to the left of these doors, SSI and New Jersey Care, those are the ones that are for people who are much lower income, maxing out at 100% of poverty. Um, but as you move to the right, some of those programs have much more generous income uh, limits. And in case of workability that Charlie's gonna talk about um, also resources, um, and then under MLTSS, that I would also put in that door, the DD supports uh, program and the community care program. Next slide. And I'm gonna turn it over to you now, Charlie, to talk about workability, which is one of the doors under our umbrella that we were just looking at. Thank you, Gwen, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, New Jersey workability, which is one of those doors you saw on the other slide. It's just another flavor of Medicaid. And in this case, it's something the state of New Jersey offers. That's why it's called New Jersey Workability. Um, the basic eligibility criteria are, they tend to be a little bit more liberal with this program as opposed to others. Oh, are we going back to the first slide? Looks like we moved. Yep, so the eligibility criteria is, is fairly um, beneficial to people applying. It's currently between ages of 16 and 64 that you can apply. You do need to work though for New Jersey workability. Uh, that could be either full-time or part-time employment. You'd have to provide proof of that, such as a W-2 or some other documentation. If you're self-employed, the limit is fairly low. You only need net earnings of $400 a year and proof of a federal tax return that you filed uh, showing you've earned that amount of income. Uh, you have to be disabled as well, and proof of disability could come from either Social Security or the Disability Review Team at DMOS or the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services. Um, if you take a look at the, um, the requirements here for New Jersey Workability, as I said earlier, they tend to be fairly liberal. Um, so this is a program for those people, even if you work part-time, just a small amount, but you're earning just enough income, you can qualify for Medicaid under this program. Next slide, please. Now, these are some other basic facts about the program. It, it can get a little complicated when you have both earned and unearned income. Um, one of the things they do is they exclude certain assets, which doesn't happen other, under other programs. That's why it tends to be a bit more liberal. They don't include certain assets, specifically a primary home, 
a car that you use for work or medical transportation, a New Jersey ABLE account, which is achieving a better life experience. That's an account where you can shelter income. Looks like we've moved ahead again. Um, and uh, 401ks and IRAs, retirement accounts are also excluded. So that helps you become eligible for Medicaid a lot easier than other traditional programs. And lastly, you can have liquid assets. You might have cash or bonds or things of that nature. They are also excluded. It's $20,000 for an individual and 30 for a couple. So again, because this program has eligibility criteria that tend to be a little bit more progressive and beneficial, it's a really important program to look at when you're looking at all the different doors and you go down to the Board of Social Services to decide which program uh, you might be eligible for. Uh, I'm gonna let Michael um, now move on to talk about uh, managed care organizations. And if anyone has questions, they can always ask me some more details about the workability program. Michael. Thank you, Charlie. And good morning, everybody. Um, Denise, could we go to the next slide, please? Oh, we're here, perfect. Stay where we're at, beautiful. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Michael Brower. I am a managing attorney here at Disability Rights New Jersey. Um, I just dropped into the chat um, part one, and I'm going to tease part two of our Managed Care Appeals Self-Advocacy Series. Um, and Gwen and Charlie just talked about the doorways that people can use to get into the Medicaid program. And once you're in Medicaid um, in New Jersey, 99% of Medicaid enrollees uh, get signed up through what's called managed care. And managed care, in a nutshell, is a series of five private insurance companies that have contracted with the state to administer the Medicaid benefits that you get. So you would get a card that says, you know, Aetna or WellCare or Horizon or United Healthcare, um, and that would actually be the card that you used if you went to the doctor or to the hospital or to fill a prescription, um, or if you're looking for home care services like personal care assistance or even private duty nursing if you're on MLTSS or if you're a child. Um, all those actual Medicaid services, the medical process, that's all paid for through the managed care system. So, you know, Aetna, WellCare, uh, Horizon, United, um, these are the folks that would actually be paying your claims, almost like as if you had, you know, group insurance through an employer. Um, of course, everything that you want isn't always covered, and sometimes things that you need get denied. Um, and when you get something like a denial, that's called an adverse benefit determination in the Medicaid world. So if you ask for home care services and they get denied, or if you've been getting home care services and your managed care organization suddenly decides that they've done a reevaluation and you don't need that level, or maybe you don't need them at all. So they either reduce or terminate those home care services. That's an adverse benefit determination. The good news is that you have the right to appeal because this is a government service, there's due process rights that attach to it. So you have the right to be heard before a service that you're already getting gets reduced, limited, or terminated. If you have a denial, meaning you're asking for something for the first time and your MCO, your managed care organization says no, um, you have the right to get a notice of that and appeal. Obviously it doesn't start because you haven't been getting it before, uh, but you have the right to be heard. Comes in a two-step process. The first process is an internal appeal where you ask the managed care organization to take a second look. Um, the second step of that process is called a fair hearing. If you and the managed care organization don't agree after that internal review, a fair hearing is a chance to get in front of an administrative law judge, and have an impartial hearing, present facts and evidence, and witnesses, um, and to get initial decision by the administrative law judge, and a final review by our state Medicaid agency, independent of the managed care orgs. I put a few examples up on the slide of what might be uh, pretty common adverse benefit determinations. Someone who's receiving a certain amount of personal care assistance every week, a reassessment occurs, and then those get reduced. Um, you're receiving acute rehabilitation services, maybe like physical therapy, um, but the MCO terminates them because they believe you're no longer benefiting from those services. Or, and I've seen this, you know, we've all seen this probably several dozens of times, you need a particular type of surgery, your doctor has prescribed it, but the managed care organization disagrees, thinks it's maybe not medically necessary and has denied coverage. There are just some common examples. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the important thing to remember is even though you have the right to appeal these kind of determinations, and even though you have the right to have be heard before the termination goes into effect, there is a very, very tight window for you to make these appeals and get continuation of benefits. It's a, such a short deadline that it's easy to blow it. It's only 10 days, and it's 10 days from the date on the notice. So if your managed care organization sends you a letter dated September the 10th, 2021, and says, we've decided to cut and terminate your personal care assistance. We're no longer going to send a personal care assistant to your home to help you achieve the activities of daily living. You only have 10 days from the date of that notice to notify them that you'd like to request your appeal and continuation of benefits. If you do it on day 11, so today is September the 23rd, 2021. If you did it today, you might be too late and you might lose those services. You still have the right to appeal, but you might lose the services while you go through the appeal and you'd have to fight the appeal without the benefit of those services. If you go through the internal appeal process and the determination or the outcome from that internal appeal is that those services are still terminated, that the MCO hasn't changed its own mind, um, you have the right to the fair hearing. Again, a 10 day clock starts ticking. You need to request a fair hearing within 10 days on the notice of resolution from your internal appeal. If you do it after the 10 days, you might still have the opportunity to go through the appeal but you might not have continuation of benefits while you go through that process. For most folks, they're so reliant on those services that without them, it might make it impossible to even continue to fight the appeal. So if there's one takeaway you have, again, the link for the, the full process for going through the internal appeal process, getting to the fair hearing and preserving your rights is in the link in the chat. But if there's one takeaway, it's there's 10 days from the date on the notice. Um, there are a few exceptions to that. But honestly, they're so technical that it's better to stick to the general rule to play on the safe side 10 days from the date of the notice in the first place when you get your initial notice, or in the second place if you lose on the internal appeal and still wish to appeal. Those are the takeaways. I'm going to stop there and move to the next slide. I'm going to tease um, the next part of our MCO or managed care appeal process. I'm going to put this timeline up here. The next step is a lot more complicated. And my goal with this next uh, presentation that will be coming out within the next couple of days is going to be to help a self-advocate who maybe knows nothing about this process get from the point where they've requested the fair hearing and preserve the continuation of rights all the way through an end where they get a final determination from the state Medicaid agency on what should actually happen with the disputed service. As you can see from the timeline, it's a little bit complicated. There's a couple of deadlines, there's a couple of processes, um, and what we're looking for uh, would be for, again, a self-advocate to be able to get from the beginning to the end of that with or without an attorney, or if they have a lawyer or an advocate representing them or helping them through the process, to be more effective at working with their advocate or attorney to get through and get through successfully. Um, but this is just a teaser. That's going to be way more material than we can cover here this morning. So I'm going to leave that there. Um, and then we'll be sharing that link once the, the full set of um, self-advocacy guides are ready for you. Next slide, please. And I'm going to continue on and loop this all back to what Gwen and Charlie were talking about and just the little current events. <laughs> There's a global pandemic that's still going on and we are still in the middle of a public health emergency. Uh, that the federal de government declared back in March of 2020. Um, the good news for folks on Medicaid is that eligibility itself, not necessarily the individual services and supports, but eligibility to be enrolled in the program, Congress protected that right at the outset with the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act. They put a stop, and up on the screen is a picture of a crossing signal with the hand saying stop. Um, the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act put a stop to Medicaid terminations, meaning that if you lost your eligibility for Medicaid during the public health emergency, states, and particularly in our case, New Jersey, um, may not terminate you from Medicaid. They have to keep you on the program. The only reason they could disenroll you is if you voluntarily said, I no longer want Medicaid for whatever reason you had, or if you left the state. Other than that, if you had Medicaid eligibility, as of March of 2020, where if you gained Medicaid eligibility anytime during the public health emergency, the state is required to keep you on the rolls and keep you eligible for Medicaid until at least the end of the public health emergency. 
Next slide, please. Of course, that public health emergency will come to an end at some point. We don't know when, we don't know how, um, but we do know, end up on the screen is a picture of the Hoover Dam with the reservoir behind it, Lake Mead. Um, at some point that dam is going to come down because the public health emergency will end. All of those people who potentially lost their Medicaid eligibility through the door they came in. So for example, if you got your Medicaid eligibility because you received supplemental security income or SSI, and at some point during the pandemic, you lost that for whatever reason, maybe you went to work and you started earning an income um, and you financially worked your way out of SSI eligibility, um, or maybe you started receiving a derivative benefit from a parent's account and that offset your SSI benefits, you're no longer eligible. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons you might lose that, but you might be in that reservoir right now waiting for your Medicaid eligibility um, to end at the public health emergency. The federal government has given our state some specific guidelines and all the states some very specific guidelines about taking their time, making a redetermination evaluation on everybody who lost or potentially lost their Medicaid eligibility. So if you're that person who lost your SSI because you went to work, maybe now you qualify for Medicaid through the workability door. Um, the federal government has given the state 12 months after the end of the public health emergency whenever that happens, to redetermine everybody's eligibility and to look at all the possible doors they might fit under. So it's a good time now um, to follow that link to the Medicaid eligibility presentation so that you can see if you've potentially lost eligibility under one door, or maybe even if you've gotten some kind of communication or notice um, that you've lost Medicaid eligibility under the door you first came in through, um, to see if there's another door that you might fit. That way you can help and grease the skids a little bit to make sure that you're going in the right direction to a door that fits your circumstances now, or you might find out that you don't have any doors that fit your circumstances anymore. And you may have to start planning for losing your Medicaid coverage if none of them fit your circumstance anymore. Um, never too early to start looking ahead. Next slide, please. All right, I think that's the end of my section of our presentation. We wanna pivot now and open this up for a little bit more of an open discussion. Um, so Gwen and Charlie, if you want to unmute yourselves. Yeah. So, so Michael, before we do that, I, I have two things that I, I did <laughs> want to share. Um, one is, and I apologize for this, because do we think that the renewal slide is after the questions? Great. So I'm just going to touch on this now before the questions. So um, uh, New Jersey's Medicaid program is delivered both through its state plan for all those things like your doctor's visits and hospitalization. And in fact, personal care assistance is under um, that regular plan. Um, but we also have uh, the New Jersey um, waiver, 1115 waiver called the New Jersey Family Care Demonstration Waiver. I believe that's the name now. And it is up uh, for renewal every five years. So we are in the beginning process of that renewal for next summer. And so the state at this point is seeking comments on the draft of the re waiver renewal. Um, and those comments are due on October 11th. Um, so right around the corner. And next week, I believe on the 27th, they have the second listening session where they're going to explain some of the things that they're changing. And you know, some of it is very good and really innovative. Um, for example, they're really trying to incorporate uh, social determinants of health and in particular housing benefit support, housing support benefits um, into the waiver. So you may wanna take a look at that. You may wanna sign up for the session next week. Um, and, and certainly the state really wants to hear from everybody um, on any comments uh, that they might have. So uh, Denise, you can pop back to the question slide now. Sorry, we, we little topsy-turvy there. Um, and then I had one other thing, Michael, that I was gonna say about what you said, which was um, very helpful and informative, but of course it has now slipped my mind. So I'm sure it will come back to me in the course of this and then I will circle back on it. Um, I would encourage people, uh, I don't know, uh, Denise, if we were planning to open, we don't have, we have about 20 people. I, I, can we open people's microphones to have people ask questions or do we want them to put them in the chat box? I'm, I'm fine with people uh, taking themselves off the microphone. I think we have a manageable group for that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's totally fine. Um, some people are more comfortable um, asking the questions 
um, you know. Uh, so, so while we're waiting for people to do that, um, I have a question that I'm going to uh, ask Charlie because it's a question that we get uh, with some frequency. So with the workability program, one needs to be working. And with the, with the um, pandemic, that situation really may have changed for some people. So um, let's say they're not working at the end of the public health emergency. Um, what then, what should they think, be thinking about now so that they can be prepared for that when the public health emergency comes to an end? Well, the first thing besides obviously looking for some sort of employment because workability really has such a low threshold uh, would be to go down to your board of social services and find out what are the programs you might be eligible for. Uh, as Gwen mentioned earlier, it's their obligation to determine eligibility for any of the programs that were mentioned earlier uh, under that slide with the umbrella. I mean, there is a moratorium right now, which is good, but as Michael mentioned, eventually it will come to an end. And now is the time to start thinking about, well, if I can't find active employment, uh, even if it's just a small amount of income I need to qualify, then I need to start thinking about, do I qualify for other Medicaid programs? And I need to go to the Board of Social Services and start that process. Now, some places may be open, some may do it online, or you may have to email, but I'd strongly suggest people sitting down and seeing where they are right now in their circumstances with coverage and thinking about what can I do to make sure there's no gap in that coverage uh, when things change in the future. And how about, can you address one of the things you mentioned about the workability program is it's really generous resource um, levels. And since we didn't right. have the whole presentation today, those resource levels are, um, are very different than the rest of the Medicaid programs, right? So while um, expansion Medicaid has no resource limit, many people are on MLTS uh, or are you know, on programs where the resource limit is either $2,000 or $4,000, so really low resources. So any thoughts about how people can think about that if they're not gonna go back to work? Uh, well, if they're not gonna go back to work, they can always think about um, applying for traditional um, coverage through SSI. They might have just Medicaid only. Um, I would say with workability though, to the extent that you are able to find employment, uh, the ceiling for earned income one can have for workability is pretty high. For a single individual, it's $65,000. And for a couple, it's about $87,000. Um, so that's assuming you can even find some work. And if you're self-employed, as I mentioned earlier, $400 is not a lot of money. Um, the goal is to basically look at your financial circumstances and see which program you might be eligible for. And that's when you can need the assistance of other people hopefully the Board of Social Services, uh, or you could of course contact our office for further information. So great, thanks. That was really helpful, Charlie. Um, I'd also just say, you know, thinking about, Charlie had mentioned this in his presentation, but thinking about um, with, with respect to resources, an ABLE account, or maybe even a, needing a special needs trust if, um, if you're not going to be eligible for workability anymore to think about those resources that you might have and how you can ensure that those resource, accountable resources are below the very low levels of $2,000 or $4,000. So, um, you know, that could be a call to us. It could also really be a call to a private attorney. Um, Denise, I'm gonna turn it back to you because it looks like there's a question in the um, chat. Maybe you can read that aloud and we can think about who, who best to answer that here. Sure. Um, were there any different criteria for emergency CCP during pandemic? And will those continue? And I'm aware of a number of successful applications from the priority waiting list. I'll take that one. Um, so the answer, Laura, to your question is, as far as I know, no. The Just to give a little context, so the CCP is the community care program. That's one of the waiver programs that's operated by the Division of Developmental Disabilities, um, people who meet the, what's called the Intermediate Care Facility for People with Intellectual Developmental Disabilities, or ICF, IDD. Um, 
think about in our state, the developmental center. So somebody who without additional community supports might need to live in a developmental center to receive the services and supports they need to survive and thrive. Um, people who have that level of care and intellectual developmental disability can get a higher level of supports for folks who don't meet that level, but who still have a developmental disability. Um, DDD operates the supports program. Um, both of them are waiver programs, both are incorporated in the 1115, which, as a little side note, if you're at all interested in either of those, it would be behoove you to go and read the comprehensive renewal program that's in the chat and make a comment on some of those small changes that are being made to both programs. That all being said, to answer your actual question, Laura, the actual eligibility criteria did not change because of the public health emergency. People who are enrolled and it's pretty rare for people who meet that level of care because of a developmental disability. Um, it's pretty rare for that situation to change because it is a developmental disability. They tend to be lifelong and they tend to generally persist through the life cycle. Um, people who are enrolled didn't get disenrolled because of the moratorium. I believe that DDD was able to secure a few more extra beds during the pandemic. Um, but the actual eligibility for an emergency placement, that is whether you're homeless or at risk of homelessness, or you're in imminent peril in your current placement because potentially you had a caregiver who had passed away or had become ill, or just no longer because of maybe age or their own disability wasn't able to care for you at home. Those are the kind of scenarios that usually trigger, or trigger an emergency placement in DDD for the community care program. Um, those were the same the whole time. So it's possible that just beds opened up. Um, it's really sad, but a lot of uh, recipients in the community care program mm -hmm. either passed away or became um, very ill because of the pandemic. So potentially slots opened up that way, which could have accelerated movement from the waiting list into the actual community care program itself. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, but we did have a question that actually was sent in um, to um, through an email earlier in the week, and I wanted to address it here. Um, and this actually, I believe, goes to uh, Charlie. Um, so can someone own or have a car while participating in the workability program? Yes, that's one of the exclusions in terms of assets. Uh, you're allowed to have a car for work or medical reasons. So for that sort of transportation, that would be excluded as an asset. But just as I indicated, a primary home is also excluded. Uh, they've also excluded New Jersey ABLE accounts that, that Gwen had referenced. That's to uh, achieve a better life experience account where people who are disabled can shelter income. It won't be counted for various public benefits programs. Um, so again, that's another example of how generous workability is as opposed to some of the more stringent eligibility requirements for say, traditional uh, Medicaid, if you had SSI related Medicaid, for example. But yes, you can have a car for work and, uh, and medical reasons. Okay, thank you. Um, we have about five more minutes. Um, if anyone has any other questions, um, you know, please feel free to um, unmute yourself. Um, a question in the chat. Um, we'd be happy to answer them. Laura's got her hand raised. Go ahead, Laura. I do. Okay, so another thing that we have discussed over the past year or two with the ombudsman um, is how the way that the supports or DD or CCP works with DSPs is that um, the the home and the DSP do not get paid if the individual is not present. So they were having issues with transitioning people back to their day programs. They were having issues with um, people taking their family members out of the setting and then this, the home doesn't get paid. Is that one of the, I, cause I had ignored the call to join the family care uh, video until I heard what you said. And it sounds like that might actually be included as one of the things that they're talking about with the um, free application in the demo, whatever they call that. 
Yeah, so uh, our team actually sat down yesterday afternoon and did a, 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 the first real review of the draft memo. Uh, we've all kind of read it and then we we're splitting up how we're, because obviously disability rights is going to have things to say about the, the renewal application in all different parts. Some of it we like, some of it we think there could be better. Um, I don't think that any of the sections dealing with either the support program or the community care program address specifically continuing or changing the way that the fee for service model works. That is, everyone gets paid based on a set increment. And if somebody doesn't use that increment, the state doesn't pay out for non-use. Under the old system, it used to be a contract. There was kind of a flat fee. It didn't really matter if you were there or not there. Um, I don't think there's any major changes to fee for service when it comes to either of the DDD programs. Uh, so this might be a good chance, Laurie, if you've got something this to say about my it. my opportunity to, to say something. This is your I, chance. This is going to be yeah. the rules for the next five years. So I'm representing the caregivers. I was, I was one of the, unfortunately, um, for the opening testimony for caregivers, um, there were very few parents of small children who participated because they're all too busy. It was all people who were retired and adult had adults in developmental disability um, situations. But um, I can represent that I have qualms about should my son actually get um, housing as an adult um, that I will not be able to do things with him because that would involve taking him out. Um, if he has a one-to-one -one DSP, we could take the DSP with us if the, if the agency will let us. But if he does not have a one-to-one, -one, if he is in either a two-to-one or something like along those lines, then I would be impoverishing his setting for him to have family time. I would oh. have to visit him in his home, not yes. reverse. So Laura, I think that you've raised an excellent point that we will take a look at as we prepare our comments and right. absolutely encourage you we to- We need more, we need some provision for family and community inclusion in which the home is not impoverished and we don't have to lose a caregiver for the opportunity for somebody to join their family for dinner in the family Absolutely. home. Absolutely. And, and there are kind of two different things here. There's the service part that I think you just well explained about being able to have the DSP come out with you when you do with your son, when you do that. And the other piece that you kind of touched on a little bit was what I'm gonna call the room and board piece of it, right? So the room and board piece should be paid outside of the waiver and shouldn't really be affected. Um, it's like paying rent, right? Like when you say to your landlord, I pay rent, but I'm going to go visit somebody. Right. For the so I'm not going to pay my rent for that weekend. So we will look into that. I don't know the answer to that, I'll tell you. But, but I know, for example, in an assisted living, which is another example of a home and community-based setting, people who are on Medicaid there, they pay their room and board for the whole month, even if they go visit somebody for the weekend. So we'll take- right. a And I'm, I'm talking about um, the, the, the individuals that I know the most closely are E, D, and D, A, and J, CAT tiers. So the highest levels of tiers. Yep. Um, some of them have one-to-ones, but not necessarily. If it's a one-to-one -one and the one-to-one -one is willing to go with you and has a way of getting back, um, should their, you know, their, their shift change, because that they, then I've heard of people having to plan around a shift change if they were going to go out to a McDonald's even, um, because that becomes an issue. And um, we have, you know, a lot of family in the Jersey area that when my son is finally not living with me, um, would want to not just visit him in his home, but also have him come to their homes. And that wouldn't necessarily require a DSP. And if he doesn't have a one-to-one -one DSP, that person couldn't be sacrificed anyway. Right, thank you so much for those comments. I think they're really important. Denise, I'm keeping an eye on the time. Did you have uh, some wrap up comments that you wanted to make? Um, no, I just, I, I'm checking the chat. I don't see any other questions and no other hands raised. So um, I want to say thank you, everyone. Uh, yep, for thank you. And, and about housing related questions, is there a particular contact that I should have at DRNJ? Because there's there are some issues that I was going to consult a you know a lawyer about, but I'd rather talk to you folks first. See if there's so, any red materials. So I think our um, web address has already been put in the chat box. There is an in online intake form there. Um, and then I guess uh, the other, Denise, what's the other best way to, easy to say right now to do intake? So you can send um, a request to our intake unit at disabilityrightsnj.org 
or go to our website, disabilityrightsnj.org, and there is a get help button that has a complete intake form. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you everybody for joining us today. And we would encourage you to take a look at the other materials that are on our website. And apparently Michael is teasing. There'll be another one on the website next week. Very exciting. Um, and thank you to Denise for hosting and to Charlie for um, his uh, real expertise on the workability program and for Michael on um, all these other appeal issues. Uh, and, you know, uh, encourage uh, other people to reach out to Disability Rights New Jersey or to check out the website for these materials. We really want to make sure they're spread far and wide. And also finally, a last shout out again to the New Jersey Council for Developmental Disabilities. We couldn't have done all of this without their uh, generous support. So thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.